Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the morning service here at Open Door Baptist Church. I'd like to start off with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8, where the Apostle Paul said to the church of Corinth, and he says to you and I today, Therefore, my beloved brethren, <clears throat> be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, this service today um, will be... The focus of it will be certainly preparing for revival, but also we'll be taking a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and seeing the uh, imperative that the Lord commands us to be steadfast, but the great hope that that gives us today. So we're looking forward to that. If, you have, if you're going to be using your hymn books this morning, our first song is The Comforter Has Come. It's on page 349. 349, we'll be singing the first, the second, and the fourth stanzas. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as we sing, The Comforter Has Come. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound. Let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise give. Oh, spread the tidings round. The Comforter has come. The long, long night is past. The morning breaks at last. And hush the dreadful wail and fury of the blast. As o'er the golden hills, the joy advances fast. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Verse 4. Oh, boundless love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell? The matchless grace divine That I, a child of hell Should in his image shine The Comforter has come The Comforter has come The Comforter has come The Holy Ghost from heaven The Father's promise given Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. And we'll continue with the hymn, Revive Us Again. It's page 343. If you're using your hymn books, we'll sing all four stanzas of Revive Us Again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, 
thine the glory. Revive us again. Verse 4. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Great singing. Brother Michael Barnett, if you could lead us in a word of prayer, please. Amen. Thank you. You may have a seat. I want to share just a few announcements and reminder for the church family. Um, just, I think it was a week and a half or so ago, we were able to send um, a, a gift of $500 to uh, the Jones family, which are missionaries to Native Americans. And uh, they were um, raising funds for a new church building to purchase a church building. And um, they sent this thank you note. Dear Open Door Baptist Church, we want to thank you for your heart for missions and the Native American people. We are so grateful for your generous donation towards the building fund for New Haven Baptist Church. We are excited to see how God uses this work to share his word. Sincerely, the Jones family, missionaries to Native Americans, Colossians 1.18. And I believe that they're just, uh, the total purchase price was 37000 That's with closing. Um, and they raised just a little over 10000 more than that, uh, which will help with some of the, the repairs, specifically with the air conditioning and other things as well. They're hoping uh, to close on that in the next week or two, so please continue to pray for them. I uh, also wanted to mention just a few things from the bulletin. Uh, if you picked up a bulletin inside, uh, the bulletin was one of our um, preliminary uh, date service schedule, and um, some of you may have already picked that up. And so it's got uh, 2021. Of course, this is all subject to change uh, for the Lord um, and uh, his schedule for us. We've got some important things scheduled um, on there, um, things such as Lord's Supper services and things that we're pretty certain will happen um, if the Lord allows. And so make sure that you take note of that. And it's hard to believe that today's the last day of January. And that already uh, the month of January is is come, and tomorrow it will be gone. And uh, so we're excited about what um, the Lord has for us. And of course, uh, the big event in February is uh, f February 11th through the 14th. We'll be having our church revival with evangelist Chris Miller. And I was talking to Pastor Morris earlier this week, and he was kind of asking how the church was doing and if we had any special plans for our 11-year anniversary and I share with them, well, we're having revival services. And so on our 11th year anniversary, on February 14th, we'll actually have revival services. He says, oh, that's a great way uh, to celebrate the Lord and his faithfulness and uh, to uh, be challenged to continue to go for the Lord. So um, the uh, schedule is there uh, for your help, and especially it has some important dates regarding the summer as far as uh, camp, retreats, and uh, VBS as well is on there. Um, then um, just from the actual bulletin, uh, Sandy and Sue have been working on pictures and information for a church directory uh, that is coming together. And as soon as they get a preliminary copy, we'll uh, be going around just to make sure before it's uh, actually printed um, that uh, everything is correct. And so we appreciate all the work that they've been doing. Uh, also, announcement about the revival services and hope you plan now to attend all those services. Uh, we also have an announcement about a youth activity scheduled for the 20th. That's a Saturday from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's for 7th through 12th grader. We're going to be playing 7th through 12th graders. We're going to be playing Ultimate Frisbee with Sun and Shield Baptist Church. We're going to meet there at Riverfront Park and uh, have an activity with our teens and their teens. And so please, uh, teens, please let me know if you're able to attend. Then there's an announcement about the men's conference as well. Also wanted to mention that tonight in our evening service, uh, uh, Brother Bob Larson from BIMI will be with us. He'll actually be sharing a new presentation uh, with Reese, um, 
BIMI, uh, which is a mission um, agency that uh, probably about half of our missionaries uh, go through, uh, but they have a local church planning here in the States ministry, Reseeding America, and he's heavily involved with that. Back when we first started the church, back in 2010, he came with his wife uh, for Sunday services to encourage our hearts. So he'll be preaching for the evening service tonight. He'll also be sharing a presentation as well. And uh, BIMI's Reseeding America is very similar uh, in many aspects to what Brother Roland does with Baptist Church Planning Ministry. And so Brother Larson has a heart for church planning here in America, and I'm encouraged uh, to have him tonight as part of our church um, service. And so come tonight prepared, ready to have your hearts challenged for church planning here in America. Well, let's continue with our singing, page 351. 351, tell it to Jesus. You can remain seated as we sing. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Verse 2. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Verse 4, are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, for Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, He is a friend that's well known. You no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. And then our revival chorus, we'll sing through twice together, Lord, send us revival. Lord, send us revival, renew, revive, we pray. Lord, send us revival, stir our hearts, revive today. Obeying, trusting every day, completely yielding in every way. Lord, send us revival, revive us again today. Lord, send us revival, renew, revive, we pray. Lord, send us revival, stir our hearts, revive today. Obeying, trusting every day, completely yielding in every way. Lord, send us revival, revive us again today. Great singing today. I think you're getting that chorus down. Wonderful. Well, Cindy's going to be playing a special for us, and then... Uh, Jody and Kylie will be coming and um, having a special for us as well.
sacrifice to me. I know tears rolled down and breath was hard to come by. As Abraham was now there on his knees. So hand in hand they headed up the mountain. And he thought about the thing that laid in store. Like shattered glass, his heart inside was breaking. Cause he'd never known a pain like this before. Too soon they reached the spot where they were going. And he laid Isaac down on his deathbed. His heart raced as he drew the knife to strike him. But a God of mercy stopped him and he said, I just wanted you to know exactly how it feels to watch the son you love walk up the lonely hills to feel the pain inside your heart breaks in your chest to lose the very thing that you love the best. So now you walk a walk and to know you'll understand the price that must be paid to correct the sins of men. So you'll know just how I feel when they walk him up that hill. I just wanted you to know. Thank you for that. That's special, and certainly the story of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, I can't imagine, as a father, uh, the Lord asking um, to give your your son like God asked Abraham to. Um, talk about uh, a hopeless situation. Um, but yet Abraham trusted the Lord, and, and he had faith and was obedient. And God took that hopeless situation and gave hope. And uh, that's really the purpose of the message this morning that we're going to be looking at from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is hope that we all need. Uh, we're going to dismiss our children for their children's church service. And then um, if you would please join with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I came across a couple of illustrations that I'd like to open the message with, and then we'll be right in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, this one is from a tale of the tardy ox cart written by Chuck Swindoll, and it's entitled, Is There Any Hope? Years ago on an S-4 submarine, it was rammed by a ship off the coast of Massachusetts, and it sank immediately. The entire crew was trapped in a prison house of death. Every effort was made to rescue the crew, but all ultimately failed. Near the end of the ordeal, a deep sea diver who was doing everything in his power to find a way for the crew's release thought he heard a tapping of steel wall of the sunken sub. He placed his helmet up against the side of the vessel and he realized it was Morse code. He attached himself to the side, and he spelled out in his mind the message being tapped from within. The message was a repeating question. The question was, is there any hope? Unfortunately, for that submarine crew, there was no hope. And all of them perished. We think about our military personnel that are serving right now. We think about their families, and I'm sure the questions are asked, is there hope? 
In previous wars, many of our military uh, servicemen and some women were captured by the enemy. Um, in his book, The Case for Hope by Lee Strobel, he had this excerpt which is entitled, What Happens When We Lose Hope? Harold Kushner was a prisoner of the Viet Cong for more than five years. Kushner describes one of his fellow American prisoners, a tough 24-year-old Marine who had made a deal with the captor. The Marine agreed to cooperate with the enemy and in return the commander of the prison camp promised he would let him go. The young Marine did whatever was asked of him. He was a model prisoner and he even became the leader of the camp's thought reform group. But before long it became clear to him that the camp commander had lied to him and that the Viet Cong had no intention of actually releasing him. This is how Major Kushner described what happened next to the Marine. When the full realization of this took hold, he became a zombie. He refused to do work. He rejected all offers of food and encouragement. He simply lay on his cot, sucking his thumb. In a matter of weeks, he died. The case of this prisoner's death might be summarized in one word. Hopelessness. There's little doubt that hopelessness can kill. In World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, many prisoners died from a condition doctors named give up itis. The prisoners faced grim conditions and had no apparent prospect of freedom, and some of them became demoralized and deeply mired in despair. After a while, they turned apathetic. They refused to eat or drink. They spent their time staring blankly into space, drained of hope. These prisoners gradually wasted away and died. The human spirit, the spirit that God created us with, needs hope to survive and thrive. Dr. Arnold Hutchnecker said these words, Since my early years as a physician, I learned that taking away hope is, to most people, pronouncing a death sentence. Their already hard-pressed will to live can become paralyzed, and they may give up and pass away. You know, in our, our world today, you know, we, we now are one month into 2021. And uh, I'm sure that there was some hope coming out of 2020, coming into 2021. But it seems that 2021 is going to be a lot more of the same of 2020 when it comes to trouble and difficulty and challenge, and trials. And, and it may be that in your life, emotionally, physically, spiritually, you're drained. And you're wondering, is there any hope? The church of Corinth that Paul was writing to in the first and second letters of Corinth, they were a church that was full of all sorts of problems. They had division within the church. There was sin that was being to tolerated amongst the members. There was false doctrine that was being taught within the church. Fleshliness was, was prominent in the actual worship services. And Paul wrote this letter underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to address these problems that the believers in Corinth were having and bring them back to Bible faith, bring them back to Bible living. In chapter 15, there was a problem that the Sadducees were influencing the believers in Corinth, saying that there is no life after death. Once you die, it's it. And you, you can understand how believers who the Apostle Paul had taught that Jesus Christ died, yes, he was buried, yes, but again, he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he's alive today. You can think how troublesome that was if, if these people are saying that there is no life after death, but Paul said that there is life after death and that Christ is alive, uh, 
if these people are right, then everything that Paul taught is a lie. And all of the promises that we were banking our lives on are empty. Paul said, we are of all men most miserable if Christ did not rise from the dead. But he doesn't stop there. He continues in chapter 15, he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep slept. So in other words, not only did Christ rise from the dead, but also those who have died in Christ, who knew Christ as their Savior, they also will be raised again. Their, their body that was sown in corruption, as he goes in 1 Corinthians 15, will be raised in incorruption. Now, doctrinally speaking, when it comes to eschatology, things that are going to happen in the future, we believe that that will be at the rapture. At the last part of this chapter, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to, to be with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. And so the believers in Corinth were having some, some difficulties. They were being influenced by some wrong sources, some false information. And, and even in this chapter, Paul says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And I want to encourage you this morning that if, if you are here this morning or if you're listening to this message and you have a sense of hopelessness deep within your heart, I want to encourage you to come back to the Word of God, to come back to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit of God that lives within you, that wants to give you hope based upon His words and promises. And sometimes we listen to ourselves and we're deceived, even by our own emotions. Or we may listen to the so-called experts of this world and, and we have gradual hope, but then it just gets squashed and extinguished. But I want to encourage you this morning, as we look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, that there is hope. There is hope for you and I in our daily lives. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, where again Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, three main thoughts this morning of hope. First of all, the people of hope. The people of hope. Who are people that possess great hope? Well, Paul says here in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren... Now, these would have been brethren according to nationality, Jews, but they were also brethren because they had a same father, heavenly father. Verse 1 of chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. The people delivered by God's grace are the people of hope. Uh, look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labor the more abundantly than all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with, with me. Uh, Paul is talking, uh, is, uh, is referencing his salvation experience. Now, if there's one that could be saved by works, it would have been certainly the Apostle Paul. But he understood that it was not by works of righteousness which he had done, but according to God's grace, that he is saved. And, and so it is, the people that have hope this morning are the people who have been delivered by grace. You have put your faith and trust in Christ as your personal Savior. You have recognized that you cannot save yourself, that your sins that you have committed in your life have separated you from a holy God, but you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth and he took your place. He took your punishment. He took your penalty. And he paid for that penalty so that we could have eternal life. And so that this morning helps us in the hopeless situations that we find ourselves in because we are the people of hope. 
Because if you have trusted in Christ as your personal Savior, you have been delivered by God's grace. You've been delivered from the penalty of sin. Uh, there, is there, now, there is now, therefore, no more condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the fact is, is that I have hope because I've been delivered by grace from the penalty of sin. I will die physically one day unless the Lord comes back to take us to heaven in our lifetime. And so there will be that physical death, but I don't have to worry about spiritual death being eternally separated from God from all of eternity. Because the penalty of my sin for the wages of sin is death has been paid for by Jesus Christ, and by my faith in Christ to save me, I have received the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So friend, if you are a believer this morning, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, no matter the rage of emotions that are going on inside, no matter how your body feels at the moment, no matter what pressures, what what adversity there is from without, we are the people of hope because we have been delivered by God's grace. And, and by the way, not only have we been delivered by God's grace, but you as a believer are destined for glory. This world is not your home. This is just a temporary dwelling. Even this body, it's just a, a tabernacle it's a temporary, and, and it's corruptible. The older that we get, the more things seem to fall apart. And, and, it, and it seems that sicknesses and diseases and viruses come, and, and our body gets weaker, and, and some folks even succumb to the sickness or, or the disease or the virus, and they, their body stops. But for the believer, not only have we been delivered by grace, but we're destined for glory. Look at verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are destined for glory. 1 Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 and 27. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. The people of hope are believers. Those who have been delivered by God's grace. And if you've been delivered by God's grace today, you're destined for glory. This earthly body will receive a heavenly body one day. Does that not give you hope? Aren't you thankful that this life isn't just it? How sad for people who think that this life is it. Who think that because this life is it, I've got to get more and more and more and more. But the thing is, is the more you get, the more you want, right? Ask billionaires, how much money do you still need? How much money do you need to be happy? 
more? You mean you can't live off a billion? I, I could think of how to live off a hundred thousand, but a billion dollars? You see, there's no hope. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Friend, if you know Christ is your Savior, you are part of the people of hope. You've been delivered by God's grace and you're destined for glory. Secondly, not only the people of hope, but the power of hope. The power of hope. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. That word, therefore, causes us to look back to all that Paul has said in the previous verses. The hope that we possess because Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and that we one day also will rise again, gives us motivation. Motivation, it gives us strength, it gives us power. Um, by the way, we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You see, we've been saved. We have security. But why? Is it just to hunker down? Is it just to become hermits? Or is it to serve the Lord? The power of, of our deliverance enables us to faithfully serve the Lord. Uh, knowing that God is more powerful than anything from without or within. The, the, the power of our hope. First of all, that hope causes us to be stable. The word steadfast means to be seated, settled, firmly situated. It refers to someone that's rooted and grounded in what they believe to hold true. So I, I think in a previous message I talked about doing some work in um, the master bath, doing some painting, and, and I talked about how um, you know, good clothes become work clothes because many times we husbands don't change. My mom called me that week. She said, so what clothes did you ruin? I said, Mom, I was just using it as an illustration. But we're still working on the bathroom. Now the painting is done. Um, we removed the baseboards. And so just so you know, um, when it comes to projects, I am not the project guy. Um, if I can make a mess of something, I will make a mess of something. So I've never really done baseboards before. There have been times where I've, I've attempted to, to do caulking before, like in the bathtubs and several other places, windows, but it has not turned out very well. As a matter of fact, I would be the example of what not to do when it comes to laying down caulking, big old blobs and smears all over the place. So I'm thinking, okay, i got to do this right, and I want to do this right for my wife. So I did some research. I went to YouTube, and, and I started watching several videos. I'm like, like how to cut baseboards how to mount baseboards, how to do the caulking on baseboards. And I'm like realizing, okay, when, when they say this is what not to do on the video, that's, all, that's what I did. Four key steps for perfect caulking along the line. I violated every single one of them, <laughs> not even knowing it. So I, I, I cut the baseboards, got the angles right, and I'm putting them on. And so I even pre-drilled the holes, and I'm putting the finishing nails in there, and they're not sticking. I, I mean, they kind of stick, but like there's a gap, and I'm thinking, okay, it's because of the drywall, so I'm finding the studs, and then I remember, oh, yeah, the person who built our house used metal studs not wood studs, so nails aren't going to work. And so um, I called um, Brother Ted, since he's construction man, and I asked him, what should I do? He says, well, you need to get some finishing screws. So it's amazing. Um, yesterday, I, I, I was finally ready to finish the baseboards and to do uh, the caulking along the top of it. And so I had these, these finishing screws, two and a quarter inch. Couldn't find two and a half inch, but two and a quarter inch. And so I just, and I'm using the cordless drill the church gave me, I think, two years for my birthday, and I'm using that so much. Thank you so much. And so I, I found the stud, and I put it in there, and, and I could tell when I made contact 
with the stud because it at first it pushed the baseboard out. I'm like, oh, that's good. And then it brought it all the way in. It was secure. And so now when, when the caulking came, I didn't have like a quarter inch gap between the wall and the baseboard to try and fill. It was just a nice little bead. And Robin was so pleased with, with the job that I did yesterday. And I was thankful for that. Stability is important in construction, isn't it? Very important. The foundation of which you build upon. And so it is in your life, in my life as believers, um, when so many things in this world are uncertain and unstable, God is saying for us as believers, especially when it comes to serving the Lord, that we are to be steadfast. We're to be settled. We're not to be like the double-minded man that James says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like one that is driven with the wind. Back and forth. Back and forth. You see, many times what God desires to do in and through us in serving him never gets accomplished because we haven't tapped into the power of our hope. And that's that, that we need to be settled we need to be established. We need to be secure in, okay, it's not going exactly the way that I planned. But faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. In my marriage, I, I've hit some rough bumps along the way, but I know that God has called me to that spouse. And I'm going to be faithful. Uh, I, I make, we had a conversation with, with Case, and we had several good conversations and, and one of the things that he says, you know, you know, Dad, Mom, I, I realized that I was the firstborn, and so you kind of made some mistakes with me. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what, son, we've made some mistakes with Kylie, too. And we're, we're imperfect parents trying to raise perfect children in an imperfect world, and it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But you know what? When we make a mistake... We need to admit it, ask for forgiveness, and move on, right? Because if every time we made a mistake, we just quit, we'd get nowhere. What type of hope would we have? Uh, there was one illustration that I read in preparing for this message about the difference between those that overcome and those that quit. And the difference is, is that the overcomers, they fell, but they got back up again. And in your life and my life, the power of hope is that we can be settled. We can have security. We can be stable. We can be steadfast. Not because of our own strength, our own motivation, but because of the power of God. Because of His promises. We can stand firmly upon the truths of God's Word. Hope causes us to be stable. Secondly, hope counsels us to be stubborn. Whoa, to be stubborn? I thought we were to be pliable. I thought that we were supposed to be humble, not stubborn. Uh, continue looking here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. That word unmovable has the idea not moved from a place, firmly persistent, motionless. So when we are firmly persuaded that this is a truth from God's word. That God has called me to this area of service. That God has called me to make this decision for my marriage, for my family, and serving the Lord. We're not going to move. Why? Because we are firmly convinced that this is what God has for us. And so we are unsettled. We will not be unsettled. We are unmovable. I'm thinking about those baseboards. I think they're unmovable right now. My dad and I, we did a, a, a railroad type project for some lands, landscaping improvements in our house when we first bought the house. And we've got three railroad ties kind of for erosion 
backfill it with rock and river rock. And my dad said, you know, son, we need to make sure that this will not move. So we drilled holes through the three road, road ties, and we drove rebar through the three ties and about three feet down in the ground. I think the termites will completely eat all of that railroad tie if they eat railroad tie before those things will go anywhere. It's time for us as believers to have our hope in the Lord and to be settled. To not be movable around, back and forth. Hope causes us to be stable. It causes us to be stubborn. It challenges us to be strong. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. The word abounding there has the idea of exceeding, a fixed amount, overflowing, exceeding. You know what it's like to, to pour your favorite soft drink? And maybe you pour it too fast and the fizz comes up. I don't know why, but it seems that cream soda and root beer, there's like, an unbelievable amount of fizz that comes up with those. And it's like, it takes five minutes just to pour a glass of drink, right? Um, or maybe you've opened, the, about a week or so ago, I had, we um, have like this carbonated flavored water and it was in the outside fridge. So I, I grabbed it, I brought it. As I'm walking in, I didn't drop it or anything. I didn't shake it. I opened it up, but it was on the top shelf. And so it like halfway frozen and the pressure, I mean, it just starts shooting everywhere, right? And so now I have a mess on the tile, and it sprayed on the tape, on the chair and on the table. <laughs> Finally got to the kitchen sink. I think half of the drink was gone, and the other half was frozen, so I didn't drink the drink. But in your life and my life, when it comes to thinking about what God has done for us, when it comes to thinking about his delivering us by his grace and that we're destined for glory, talk about motivation to continue even when we're tired, even when we're discouraged. You know, last night on, on Saturdays, Robin contacts all the, the kids that ride the van. And uh, by about 9.30 last night, well, none of the kids are riding the van this morning. And, and she was a little discouraged last night. And so I tried to encourage her a little bit, but I'm thankful that she got up this morning, that she came to church, that she had prepared the children's church lesson. And right there for Sophia and for Asher and Angelina, she's teaching her heart out there. That comes when we're firmly persuaded, okay, this is what God has for me. This is what God has called me to. I am going to be steadfast. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give in. And I'm going to be abounding. I'm going to allow God's love to flow from me to be overflowing. Hope causes us to be stable. It counsels us to be stubborn, and it challenges us to be strong. Is there too much that I can do in the work of the Lord? Well, not in his strength, there isn't. Turn with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And here we see how important. We, we understand that works do not save us. The Bible clearly teaches that, but it's a helpful reminder for us believers to remember that works are an important part of a believer's life. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, what doth it profit my brethren? So he's speaking to believers, same, same type of people that Paul's speaking to in Corinth, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. 
Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You know, we um, live in um, a culture, a Christianity culture, that, that loves, and, and I believe that there's a proper emphasis in this, but they love to have an emphasis on um, a lack of judgment. Don't judge me. Don't, don't judge me because God, and, and here's the, the number one basis. God sees my heart. And I agree. God told Samuel, don't look on the outward. Man looks on the outward because God looks on the heart. God knows your heart. But here's a problem. God sees the heart. That, that, that's not a problem that God sees the heart. The problem is that you and I are not God. And so when someone doesn't have food, they don't have clothing, and I profess to know Christ as my personal Savior. And this is what James is saying here. I profess to know Christ as my personal Savior. And I have the ability to provide both food and clothing for them. But I say to them, depart. Go, be filled, be clothed. When it's in my power to do it, God knows my heart. God sees my heart. But that man doesn't. That woman doesn't. That teenager doesn't. So to unbelieving man, faith without works is dead. And so when it comes to your life and my life, it is of utmost importance that we are steadfast, that we are unmovable, that we're always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's because it's so pivotal for the unbelieving, the lost world, to see our good works so that they can glorify our Father which is in heaven. For we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What are some examples of the work of the Lord? Witnessing. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Matthew 22, verses 33 through chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Verses 37 through 39. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is likened unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving God and loving others is the work of the Lord. And I tell you what, in loving God, we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. In loving others, we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Galatians 6, 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's not an option. It's a command. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. We've seen the people of hope, the power of hope, and lastly, the promise of hope. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye, we know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, those words about knowing. Hope gives us confidence. There's no sacrifice that you can make that God will not see, that God will not know, that God will not bless. There's no rebuke or rejection that you will face because of your serving the Lord, being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, that the Lord will not know, that he will not honor. Proverbs 15.3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Your service to the Lord is not in vain. It's not empty. One day he's promised to reward all. Revelation twenty two twelve. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. 
there is confidence. Hope gives us confidence, but also gives us consolation. To know that there are times when serving the Lord and being steadfast and unmovable and always bounding, it's hard. Some of the burdens, the challenges that we bear are heavy. Sometimes they seem endless and unrewarding. But God knows. God sees. And he's looking forward to the opportunity one day to say to those, the people of hope who were delivered by his grace and destined for glory, and now they're in glory. He's looking forward to those who are steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding and saying the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We're blessed today. We've got problems just like the church of Corinth had. But there is hope. We've seen the people of hope, the promise, or the power of hope, and the promises of hope. Are you resting in the promises of your hope, knowing that the Lord will be faithful to strengthen and help? Perhaps this morning you came in feeling a little hopeless. I want to encourage you that you can leave with hope. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God, I pray that you'd bless the reception of the preaching of your word this morning. Holy Spirit, would you take your word and convince hearts and minds. And even some right now as we're closing the service, some right now are really, really struggling because they're still looking to themselves and not looking to you. God, I pray that our eyes would be off ourselves and upon you. And for that hopeless situation, it may be a relationship. It may be a situation at work. It may be financial. It may be in a matter of health. It may be in a matter of, of something else. But whatever that hopeless situation is, God, may we find hope as we look to you, our source. And we're so thankful that you have saved us by your grace. And we're so thankful for the home that you've prepared for us. And we're so thankful for the strength that you give us to serve you with each day you give us here. I pray these things in Christ's name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to ask the piano to begin to play. And if in your heart you've been struggling with hope, I want to encourage you to take the next few moments, spend some time in prayer, calling out to your Abba Father your daddy father who loves you and cares for you. The altar is available up front if you'd like to pray here. If you'd like to pray with someone, we'd be happy to pray with you and encourage you from God's word. Would you respond as the Lord speaks to your heart?
Father God, we do thank you that there is hope. And I pray that we would go in the promises of your word today. We ask that you continue to watch over our church family. For those that um, are struggling with illness, I pray that you'd raise them up. For others who may be struggling with other issues, I would pray that you'd encourage their hearts. We do pray uh, for Katya and Kaysen as they've started their semester at Pensacola. I pray that you would um, help them, and uh, I pray that you would help them in their classes and their workload and just all the responsibilities that they have. We thank you for our missions family, and I thank you for uh, your faithfulness in providing the funds for the church, for the Jones, um, there with their ministry, with the Native Americans. And God, we pray that you would, um, as you promised, that you'd faithfully build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We look forward to the service tonight. We look forward to hearing from Brother Bob Larson about uh, the ministry of planting churches here in America. And I pray that... Um, We'd be encouraged and challenged. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon.